I was in school um, on 9-11. I was a 17 year old. I was a student at Stuyvesant High School and I was taking an architecture class, which is a very Stuyvesant kind of class to be taking um, on the 10th floor of the building. So the 10th floor at Stuyvesant was pretty isolated from the rest of the building. It was the only floor that you couldn't reach by escalators because Stuyvesant has escalators because it's so tall. Um, and we were like learning to draw straight lines or something like that in class. And we've been in class for about 45 minutes when we heard this huge explosion and the, the whole building shook. It felt like an earthquake. And we turned around and there was just like this huge ball of fire around the World Trade Center. And our teacher at the time was kind of this old line New York City public school teacher. He was close to retirement age. He'd been there for years. And so he'd been there during the bombing in 93 that um, Stuyvesant had just opened at that time, or was it 94? I can't remember. But um, he'd been there at that time and Stuyvesant hadn't evacuated. And so he just said, I'm just gonna keep teaching. There's no way they're gonna evacuate us. Just, we're just gonna keep going. And so as all of the other classrooms around us um, turned on televisions and like people were wandering the hallways and all sorts of you know madness was breaking out downstairs from us. We were sitting in class like going over some technical drawing uh, material and just sort of glancing nervously behind us as we watched this kind of fireball overtake the World Trade Center and no one in my class had seen that it was an airplane and so we were kind of speculating about what could have caused the explosion and we didn't know if it was an intentional explosion or an accidental explosion but it was so big um, that it was really it was distracting as you might imagine and finally someone you know came running in from another classroom and said that a plane had hit the World Trade Center which just seemed so wildly inconceivable that I don't think I really like understood what they meant by that. Um, and then I saw what I thought was a bird fly pretty close to the window and then a second explosion happened and I kind of belatedly realized that that had also been an airplane. But it did occur to me later that that is probably the last time in my life that an airplane passed overhead and I didn't notice it because ever since then I have noticed every airplane no matter how high that's in the sky i monitor airplanes in the sky if if one is flying overhead i like i watch it to make sure it makes it out of view and i it's it's so funny to me that the last airplane i wouldn't have noticed hit the world trade center right next to me um but so we couldn't we didn't have a good view of the second building because we were kind of the 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 north tower was kind of blocking our view of the second building and stuyvesant's building is about three blocks away so we had a good holistic view of the towers, but we were still pretty close. Um, and I, we just sort of continued to sit in class as my teacher kind of lost control of the lesson at that point. And, and we weren't really sure what to do. And we were getting a lot of contradictory announcements coming through um, on, on, the, on, on the PA system that was telling, you know, they were telling us to stay put and then they were telling us maybe we would evacuate and then maybe we wouldn't evacuate. And it sounded like the administration didn't really know what to do. Um, and we later learned that there had been, you know, first responder officials of some sort, maybe it was like FBI officials or something who kept coming in and out and giving them different advice. So, you know, at first we were gonna evacuate and then they were like, don't worry, they're not, the towers aren't gonna fall on you. And then they were like, actually they might fall on you, you guys should evacuate. And so they, we were sort of getting this weird uh, series of updates from the administration with contradictory information. And then finally the first tower fell. We saw this huge dust cloud rush towards the building and I decided, I've been asthmatic my whole life, and I decided that was enough for me. We were about as far from an exit as you could be at Stuyvesant in the classroom that I was in. And so I just told my teacher, I'm going to the nurse's office. I don't care if that's allowed, I'll see you later. Um, and then while I was on my way down to the nurse's office, they made an announcement that everyone should go to their homerooms. So they kind of had this weird moment where everyone started changing classes like at, after the first tower had fallen before the second tower had fallen people were crying and screaming in the hallways like no one really knew what to do um i just continued down to the nurse's office and the reason that i went to the nurse's office is because i knew that it was really close to the north north exit of the building and we were seeing people just streaming uptown um cut some of them coming through stuyvesant even um, to escape. And so I was just like, I think, you know, we're obviously going to have to evacuate north. I just want to be as close to the northern exit as possible. I think I have like a well-developed 
flight mechanism. I don't think I have a very good fight mechanism, but I think my flight mechanism is really top notch. So I was, I was preparing to evacuate long before everyone else. Um, so I went into the nurse's office, they had the radio on and on the radio, they were hearing that like, every airplane in the sky was gonna hit a building in New York City. And so every, nowhere was safe and no one was really sure what was going on. Um, and we were hearing reports that some buildings already had been hit. Like there was a lot of confusion um, on the radio that morning about what was and wasn't hit because it just seemed like everything was on fire or falling down, at least if you were located downtown. Um, so finally, <clears throat> Uh, they they decided they were going to evacuate the school, and at that point, the evacuation was just chaos. There, there was no rhyme or reason to it. I would like to think that I'm the kind of person that stayed behind to help people who needed assistance get out of the building. The nurse's office had, you know, Stuyvesant housed a program for disabled students, and the nurse's office had some of those disabled students with their aides. And I am embarrassed to say that I just sort of bolted um, and. And I, I burst out of the doors. I was one of the first students out of Stuyvesant. And basically the moment I put foot to pavement, the second tower started to fall. And so I was, not a lot of students were outside by the time that happened. And so I was really kind of alone. I looked around, I didn't recognize anyone and everyone just started running. And so I started running as well um, and ran about as far as a lifelong asthmatic can. Um, so I didn't make it very far. I started to have breathing trouble pretty soon after. Um, I did manage to stay ahead of the dust cloud, which at least was my goal. So, um, so I, I slowed down and I started walking and I started really, you know, looking for just anyone that I could recognize, um, it, you know, around me. And because there were so few people from my school around, it was just like a sea of strangers. And I finally found, um, I found like a, one of the physical education teachers that I think I'd had her for health the semester before or something like that. And she was the only person that I recognized. And so we just started walking uptown together. And as we were walking, people had pulled over their cars to, um, to kind of announce, uh, to, to play the radio for everyone so that people could hear what the news was saying. And the news was still reporting that you know tens of thousands of planes were in the sky and they were all gonna hit buildings in New York. And, I was really nervous because I grew up in Chelsea. My, my parents' apartment was very close to the Empire State Building and we were hearing that there were planes headed for the Empire State Building. We were hearing that um, you know, the Empire State Building might, might fall down that afternoon. And so I realized that I just couldn't go home and I was kind of not sure where I was supposed to go or what I was supposed to do. And I couldn't reach my parents, you know, the, the cell phone tower on the top of the World Trade Center obviously had fallen. No one could get a call in on cell phones. And so I was just kind of aimlessly walking uptown. And because we thought that at any moment we might get cut off from the north, we started to kind of discuss, you know, what what would our plan be for um, for making making it out of, off of Manhattan. It, it sort of occurred to us at that point that Manhattan is an island and you can't just walk off of an island. And I, I really, I distinctly remember her saying, we might have to swim to New Jersey. And I was just like, I grew up in Manhattan. I don't know how to swim. <laughs> like imagine not knowing how to swim becoming your biggest problem on 9-11. And um, she, the, the sort of kindest thing that she said to me, I think that day, and it's funny because this is the thing that, that most horrifies everyone that I tell this story to, but it was, it was truly like the kindest thing she could have done. She said, I'll swim you to New Jersey. <laughs> which sounds crazy because you know if you if you don't recognize the kind of danger we thought we were in it sounds like such an extreme reaction and people often say like oh she should have been more you know she she should have been more even keeled about this she should have kept you calm and i was like no we both thought we might have to swim to new jersey like that was a real plan that we had to make um and she was also i think she was 27 or something it was her second year of teaching i mean she was also a kid uh so we 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 walked uptown, we kind of gathered other Stuyvesant students as we went. Um, and uh, finally, one of the students that we gathered, who I, she remembers being with me earlier in the process, but I don't remember being with her. I know traumatic memories are sort of inherently unreliable, so I'm not really sure what the truth is. Um, but 
she she was from Astoria and she just said, you can come home with me. And so we just sort of kept walking uptown and around 59th Street, we got word that the subways were open. And so the group of students that were going back to Brooklyn kind of split off from the students that were going back to Queens. And the teacher that we had been walking with um, took those students back to Brooklyn because they, you know, we knew that we were going to be able to walk the whole way, but they were very nervous, understandably, about getting on the train. And so um, we kind of split off from them and headed across town. And I think what was so weird about that point in the walk is that is when we reached people who just like hadn't yet been personally touched by what was going on. And so there were all these people, it was a beautiful day as everyone constantly goes on about, um, but there were all these people just like eating lunch outside. Like I remember this one businessman like loosening his tie, you know, like as if he was just having like a leisurely lunch people watching as all of these people, like some of them covered in dust were marching past him. And so we, we walked across the 59th Street Bridge. It was packed, they had closed it to traffic and it was just like streams of people. And then neither of us really remembers how we got to her house after that. I know that at one point I got a call through to my parents on that walk and they said, go home. And I just said, no. Um, and I, it was funny because I think they didn't realize really, like they knew I had been really close, but it, they couldn't really empathize with like how traumatic that had been. And I also couldn't really empathize with how traumatic it would be to know your kid was down there and like that you couldn't reach them and that you weren't really sure where they were. And so we just kind of yelled at each other on the phone about, you know, where I should go. And I just kept refusing to do whatever, you know, to do what they wanted me to do. Um, and so I, I talked to them once going across town and then once I, we waited at a payphone when we got to the, you know, we got to the Queen side of the bridge and I know I spoke to them again. Um, and at some point I also spoke to a friend of mine who was, you know, also who lived in Queens and was sort of like, it was, she's the only friend I knew how to get to her house, you know, in Queens. Like I was one of those horrible obnoxious Manhattanites who doesn't really know their way around the outer boroughs. And, um, and I had one really close friend who lived in Queens and she was just like, just show up at my house, you know, if you need to, like, don't, don't worry about it. Don't call, just like show up if you need to. So I, I felt confident that I was going to stay in Queens. And then I, somehow we got back to the friend that I had been walking with's house. And this was a friend who, you know, we'd been in homeroom together, but we didn't really know each other very well. Um, and so I had never met her family. Like she had never mentioned me to them. I was just like a, a random stray that she brought home. Um, but they were very kind to me. They, fed us and let us watch television till you know the the end of the night and then um the next day her brother who was a student at hunter college took me back into the city and um we met my parents on uh, up by hunter and we walked downtown and walking back to chelsea from the upper east side was so weird it you know we were already already missing signs were going up but you could just see these like layers of of crisis kind of unfold as you went because you know uptown everything seemed pretty normal but when you got to like Times square it was oddly quiet and then you got to herald square and it was like weirdly eerie and then i think we walked down to 14th street that day because that was the that was the sort of barrier for as far downtown as you could go just to kind of see what was going on um and I was really eager to leave the city right away. Like I had made my parents promise before I came home that we could go, you know, we had family upstate. Um, we used to spend the summers up there. And so I had just said, we have to go upstate as soon as I get home. I don't want to spend any time in the city. I just want to get out of here. And um, my parents lollygagged a little. They were like, no, we'll go tomorrow. We can't go today. And so I, I remember being so furious that they wouldn't just like pack up and immediately get out of Dodge. Um, and I, I just, I spent that whole night just, you know, in, in sort of awake and panicked. Um, we had all these phone calls from all over the country when I got home about apparently some newscaster had reported from inside Stuyvesant on 9-11 that there was a bomb at Stuyvesant. And so in addition to all of the coverage about 9-11 and a lot of my family outside the city didn't really realize like how close the World Trade Center really was to Stuyvesant and how that would have been a, a thing that involved me. Um, but they kept calling about hearing that there was a bomb threat at Stuyvesant, which I thought was so weird because I hadn't heard that. Um, and also 
what does a bomb threat matter on 9-11? And we, you know, like everyone had to evacuate anyway. It was, it just seemed like such a weird thing to just constantly hear repeated in all of these phone calls from all over the country. Um, and so I, I let my mom do most of the phone calls because I didn't really want to talk about it with anyone. And then we finally, we went upstate, I think the next day or the day after and did a very Stuyvesant thing and went and visited colleges. Um, and so we went on all of these really weird college tours to like, we went to Haverford and at Haverford, I remember the, the tour guide like took us aside, the, the tour group aside and like sat us down and said, you know, we, my friends and I sat down and we decided that if we have to go to war, we're going to enlist. And I thought that was so weird because Haverford is a pacifist and it's a Quaker college. It's, it's rooted in a pacifist tradition. Like everyone was acting so sort of bizarre. And, um, and also at Haverford, they had a, a gallery named after Cantor Fitzgerald, or, you know, it, that had been sponsored by Cantor Fitzgerald and nobody said anything about it. And at that time, the one thing we knew is that almost everybody who worked at Cantor Fitzgerald had died. And, or at least we knew that in the city, but, you know, I don't think that was something that maybe was known to some of the other touring families who had used that week to go see Haverford as well. Um, and I just like couldn't get over that. Um, so for the whole length of the tour, I was just like, what weird reality are we in right now? Um, and so we went on a bunch of college tours and then I think a week later we went back to the city and, um, and a week after that, we, they said they were gonna reopen Stuyvesant but at Brooklyn Tech. And the, the way that the news got to us was really weird because you know they had, I guess, tried to call every family but the, the real source of information had been this website that was a, sort of parody website of the school's official website that an enterprising Stuyvesant student had set up. And so Stuyvesant had this website um, that I think was called Stynet.com, which was where you went to like do various early internet school things. And so one of my classmates had started Stycom.net, which was constantly running afoul of the administration, constantly getting into trouble. And Stycom.net is how we all found out when to report at Brooklyn Tech. Um, and, the, and the day that we reported to Brooklyn Tech, it was just for this for a meeting and they hadn't really worked out how it was going to work. Um, they, they thought maybe they were going to run like 20 classes at once in the auditorium. But as soon as we were in the auditorium, they realized that no one would be able to hear anything because it was one of those old New York City Board of Ed auditoriums where, you know, it was all wood and it was very echoey and the acoustics were terrible. And so they told us they would they would tell us what was going to happen once they decided. Um, so we had this long uh, we had this long assembly and then they they also did the Pledge of Allegiance for the first time ever since first grade uh, at the assembly. And there, you know, it, it was it was a weird time to ask us to engage in, you know, sort of patriotic pageantry because we at that point um, were, were so shell-shocked and also, you know, we were already, the, the national discussion was already kind of going on about, you know, who should we invade and who, where were we going to go to war? And everyone was just feeling really like weighed down by the idea that our experience was going to be used in that way, um, sort of used to justify some sort of violent incursion abroad. Like we were all these idealistic 17 year olds who, you know, wanted to kind of believe that, you know, that, that the diplomacy, you know, that we could use diplomacy to solve this or whatever. And so I just remember the there was a very uneasy feeling during that Pledge of Allegiance. Um, and then after that, they, you know, we were dismissed and then we learned that we were going to be attending school from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. And that Brooklyn Tech was going to be attending school from like 7 p.m. to 1 p.m., which their students were really, really not happy about. Um, and so we had like we, we started on the split schedule we would pass all of these Brooklyn Tech students on the way into school and they would they would like sneer at us they were so mad at us because we got the afternoon schedule um, but actually I remember those few weeks being sort of a nice reprieve from all of the pressure because we you know first of all a 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. schedule is great for a teenager sleep schedule so we were all actually like able to at least try to sleep. Um, and it also meant we could do fun things on the weeknights because we didn't have to be at school until one. So a lot of, you know, the time that I think I would have otherwise spent just panicking at home at night, 
I got to go out and do things, which was, I think, healthy. Um, because this was like a time when one, I remember once a car backfired during my math class at Brooklyn Tech and like the class just like went to pieces, you know, and no one could focus, everyone rushed to the window. It was, you know, it, it was, it was so dramatic for a sound that if you grew up in New York City, you hear a hundred times a day without thinking. Um, and so I, I, I think it was nice that we got that little bit of reprieve, but it was certainly not a working schedule. And so a few weeks in, there was a lot of pressure from the Parents Association to send us back to Stuyvesant because they wanted us to kind of regain some sense of normalcy. And this is, this is actually something I've been thinking about a lot recently because it's, it's really similar to the conversation that we've been hearing about sending kids back to school during COVID. And one thing that I've been trying to kind of point out routinely is that it did not feel normal to return back to Stuyvesant at that time. We had to go through five police checkpoints on our first day at school. They had a sign in the lobby of the school that said something along the lines of like, Stuyvesant is now more famous than anyone could ever want it to be. And so wear your IDs, implying that like terrorists might break into the school if we didn't all wear our IDs. Um, and I, I, I don't think it was until later that I realized how unprepared the adults in charge of that situation really were for the kind of trauma they were experiencing as well. You know, the administrators had also been through 9-11 with us and, and they were also not thinking straight. And so it was just a really toxic combination. We had, you know, the EPA lying about the air quality. We had a school building that to anyone's eyes and nose was definitely not safe to be in, but we were just being constantly told it's safe, we're testing, we haven't found anything, everything's fine. And then only later would they reveal that it wasn't safe and they weren't testing for the right things and it hadn't been fine. And, you know, so we, even in those early days, it, there was a lot of, you know, it, it, there, it was very discordant, you know, like what you would hear versus what you were experiencing did not really match up. And it was a very, um, an easy time to be at school and it most certainly did not feel normal. It was, you know, it, it was not a routine that I felt comfortable in. I, I, I thought about my breathing, because especially being an asthmatic, just like constantly all day, every day, it was very distracting because I just kept wondering if I was still breathing, which is crazy, but it, you know, it, it was the kind of environment where if you're someone who's already sensitive to changes in air quality, you worried that you might not be. <laughs> um, and and they, they would send these cryptic, notes home that were like don't drink out of the water fountains and no one can go out to lunch and everybody is expected to stay inside the school building between nine and three so that we don't have to open any doors and windows and you know it didn't matter because by noon it smelled like smoke in the building every day no matter what and so um and there were these little air monitors and these men in hazmat suits would like come in and check the air monitor during class and so all day you were reminded that the air wasn't right um and so after you know, a while that became its own kind of normal, but it, it really, it never felt like it had. It, it, never, it never returned to the, the kind of normalcy that was promised. Um, and then, you know, eventually, you know, we did finally get to use our auditorium um, in, at the end of the year, but that we later found out had been contaminated and not cleaned. They didn't end up cleaning the auditorium until about 2014. So, uh, so you know, it, 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 we kind of sunk back into our routines, but then as the months would progress, you know, there were parents demonstrating outside the building about the air quality. A lot of the parents who had been in favor of us returning changed their tune as soon as we came back. And so there was a lot of back and forth about whether it was safe. And, you know, the administration told us that if we left for health reasons, we couldn't come back. And, you know, the kind of work you put into getting into Stuyvesant made it made that a, a sort of barrier to anyone leaving for health reasons. So, you know, someone like myself who had a history of respiratory issues um, was, you know, was sort of being given what in Stuyvesant terms is really the choice between, you know, destroying your future or destroying your present. Like it, you know, it, it leaving Stuyvesant is, is an act of destroying your future in, in Stuyvesant mentality. Um, and, and so there was no real choice there, even though I think maybe to people who attended more traditional high schools, that would seem like, well, why didn't you just leave? But, you know, in, in the culture of Stuyvesant, you really can't ask that question in the same way. Um, and so, you know, we, uh, we, we finished school there. Uh, we did get Bill Clinton to be our graduation speaker. So that was maybe the one bright spot of, uh, 
of being the the 9-11 school. I think a lot of the other schools in the area had used our experience early on returning to push back their own return dates. So a lot of them didn't end up returning until January and February of 2002. Uh, that was still too early. And those kids were much younger than us. And most of them lived in the neighborhood, which was not the case with us. Part of what was so confusing about Stuyvesant is that because we come from all over the city, the parents weren't that tuned in to the conversation downtown. And so I think a lot of parents didn't realize how dangerous it was because they really hadn't been down there themselves and didn't really know what the community was experiencing. Um, so, you know, I think it was, it by the end of the year, everyone was back down there and we had sort of settled into a kind of routine, but it, I, I would say still to this day, it's not really very normal down there. Um, and certainly at that time, you know, in, in the midst of what became kind of a, a national conversation about uh, about security and terrorism and patriotism. We were having this other conversation the whole time that was about health that no one was really paying attention to. And that's the same, you know, the responders were also having that conversation. Um, the, the whole downtown community was kind of stuck in this weird bubble where we, the, the, the sort of tangible danger that we were experiencing was not what everyone thought we were experiencing. Everyone kept going on and on about terrorism and we were sort of stuck kind of trying to navigate what you do, you know, with a burning pile of rubble in your backyard and 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 how you keep yourself safe during a cleanup process for something like that. Um, and I, I think like, to me, that was really the most frustrating part of that experience. It was not the scariest part of that experience. 9-11 was obviously the scariest part of that experience, but the, the most frustrating part was watching the national conversation diverge so dramatically from what our actual needs were and what our actual experience was. Um, so that's my, that's my 9-11 experience. Well, how has your health held up? Um, I definitely had respiratory fallout from that experience. And, um, and the respiratory fallout was what got me involved in the health conversations, for sure, because I already, going into 9-11, I already knew how expensive respiratory health care can be. You know, our, our current health care system does not often make chronic conditions that affordable um, to treat. And, and unlike, I think one area where we really differ from the bulk of first responders, certainly not all of them, but the bulk is that being a high school student or a college student or a young adult is not a job. And so it doesn't offer health insurance. And so we got kind of released out of this um, experience with without many tangible healthcare options. It was before the ACA even. So, you know, when I moved to California, I got rejected from every healthcare plan in California one year because of pre-existing conditions and they were all 9-11 related conditions. I, I had terrible GERD, which is unfortunate, an unfortunate, very unsexy disease to have to constantly discuss, but it's also quite expensive to treat and it's very uncomfortable and it can affect other systems in your body and it certainly puts you at higher risk for some other more serious conditions. Um, and the same is true, you know, like I, the most commonly diagnosed condition is sinusitis. That is, it's, it's not a life-threatening condition, but it's incredibly uncomfortable to live with long-term. And then of course, PTSD. And one thing that even our current system doesn't really provide for very well is coverage for therapy. And so a lot of us waited just years to, be, to have access to some kind of meaningful mental health coverage because we had to wait until the World Trade Center health program was not only developed, but developed enough to provide coverage outside of New York City. Um, and so, you know, a lot, a lot of the seemingly minor health conditions related to 9-11 when you're 22 and you don't have any access to health care and you just got kicked off your parents' plan because you graduated from college actually became unaffordable to treat and and they do become quite um, quite difficult to manage once once you can't treat them. So asthma is the kind of thing that if it's controlled, it's fine. But if it's not controlled, it ruins your life, you know? Um, and so I a lot of the a lot of the chronic health fallout was was stuff that I experienced both early on and then, you know, I remember just after 9-11 or not soon after we went back to Stuyvesant, I went to go visit my pulmonologist because, you know, like I said, I, I, I've been asthmatic my whole life and he lived in Battery Park City and he was an alumni of Stuyvesant or alumnus of Stuyvesant. Stuyvesant would 
ban me if they knew I had used the wrong form of alumni, <laughs> alumnus. Um, but uh, he sort of sat me and my mom down and said, look, I don't know what to tell you. You, you absolutely shouldn't be down there, but I know that you can't leave Stuyvesant, so I don't know what to say. Um, and, and that was kind of the, the, uh, the mental, you know, sort of the, the, the message I took forward from that experience is I, I, I knew it was going to be really difficult um, in the future to treat these respiratory issues that most certainly got exacerbated by 9-11. My, my asthma was so much worse after 9-11 than it had been, you know. I had been running cross country before that, which is something that when I was 10, I would have thought I could have never done. You know, when I was 10, I had to carry an inhaler in like this lame fanny pack around all day because I would get asthma attacks constantly. And by the time I was in high school, I was running cross country. Um, and like, I, I kind of relapsed back into that earlier state, um, which was, was very concerning to me because I, I had kind of hoped that, you know, asthma often diminishes. If you have childhood asthma, it often gets less serious in your 20s. Um, and, and I kind of hoped that would be the case for me. And then I kind of had this horrible thing happen <laughs> where it just came back um, and, it, and it was very clearly triggered by this situation. And so I, you know, I, I in addition to being frustrated just because of the, the discomfort of it and the fact that I couldn't afford my asthma medication. And so I was stockpiling it and I was only using it half as much as I was supposed to. And I kind of went through years of having to get medicine under the table from my pulmonologist and all of this stuff. Um, I was frustrated because I was like almost home free when this thing happened, you know, like I had almost been able to do the things regular people do when 9-11 kind of, or, or not even 9-11, but the 9-11 cleanup kind of came into my life. Um, so my health has been better than some of my classmates, but certainly uh, there have been effects. Almost 20 years later, you mentioned the PTSD, you mentioned the car backfiring and everybody freaking. What is the emotional toll that's still with you? I think it's, I think it's layered. Um, there's, I still, especially if I have other kind of stress in my life, I still have a really hard time with sudden loud noises, with helicopters, with, you know, sounds of airplanes. I still monitor every single plane in the sky. Um, and I, you know, like I, during, during COVID, you know, nationwide, we had that scourge of like fireworks going off in the middle of the night. And I basically didn't sleep for three months over that. And I know that everyone was disturbed by that, but it was causing me a kind of, a kind of anxiety that I think was out of scale with the situation. Um, so I still have those kind of effects. Um, I have a lot also though of, I have a lot of resentment about the way that uh, this story for both 9-11 survivors and responders was, you know, pushed under the table and ignored for so long, how hard we had to work to get it taken seriously. And I think, especially on the survivor side, we have had to work really hard just to make sure that we are also included in all of the legislation that the responders are having to work so hard to get for themselves. Um, but we don't have the kind of visibility they do because of that. Almost nobody, you know, I live in California now and almost nobody here realizes how extensive my 9-11 experience was. And, um, and almost nobody knows that there was this other group that was impacted that is, you know, by number much larger than the number of first responders. And, and I find that very frustrating because I think it's, it's sort of an example of, of the way that our, you know, it's a larger example of a failing in our healthcare system and our mentality about healthcare where we sort of want people to be deserving in order to have access to care. And I think we were treated for a long time as not deserving because we hadn't done anything heroic after 9-11. Um, and, and I think the idea that like people who are stuck in a terrible situation, especially the people that are stuck by our own government in that terrible situation, don't inherently deserve anything. The fact that we had to keep pushing that and the fact that we had to keep telling sob stories about how awful things were for us um, in order to be taken seriously sort of became its own layer of frustration for me um, because it, it, I think there's, you know, it, it erases an experience that is actually much more common nationwide than we would want to believe. I mean, I think a lot about what a community that doesn't have first responders to ride the coattails of is supposed to do in a health crisis like this. Like, no wonder Flint doesn't have any clean water. 
I mean, you know, what first responders were they riding? What heroes could they ride the coattails of? Um, and so I think I, I see this pattern get repeated all the time and, and with communities that have much deeper needs even than the lower Manhattan community did. I mean, and, and also, you know, we see the unequal way that the communities in lower Manhattan got treated where, you know, you saw Chinatown get like basically ignored from this conversation for years. Um, and, and it was because people in Tribeca had a kind of political agency that wasn't shared by people in some of the lower income parts of lower Manhattan. And so they were able to get their story out in a different way. And, and that just, it sort of breaks my heart the way that I, the way that all of my kind of fears about how the system works were validated by this experience. And so I think there's sort of a second layer of trauma on it where I watch this thing that happened to me happen to communities all the time. And, and there's not anything I can do about it really as an individual. And it's, it's not something that I think Americans as a whole have the language to discuss and are primed to empathize with. And so I find that very frustrating as well. Um, and and I, I'm, I'm seeing that a lot, obviously, during COVID. I mean, COVID is like, in, in many ways, has a lot of parallels to what we went through downtown, but it, not, in, not because it you know, was a, an act of terrorism or an act of violence against anyone. It has parallels to what we went through during the cleanup. It has parallels to the version of 9-11 that no one else in the nation was listening to and still doesn't seem to be listening to. <laughs> How old were you, Lila, when you became a 9-11 activist? And what made you become such an act activist? Because you, you went to D.C., you lobbied yeah. on behalf of first responders and the 9-11 community. And we should point out that the 9-11 community, those whose health may be affected or already has been impacted by the toxic dust, we're talking 500,000 people. Right. 100,000 people are currently in the World Trade Center Health Program, 400,000 are not, and could possibly need it. Well, and the, the bulk of that 400,000 is survivors. You know, the, the survivor program, because there's a higher barrier to entry, because you have to be showing symptoms to participate in the program, um, has, you know, reached far fewer members of our community. Um, I think I, I was about to graduate from college in 2006, I was sitting in a seminar um, that was about what to do about benefits when you graduate. And the, the message was basically be an investment banker or be prepared to die in the gutter. Like there was no plan for what you were supposed to do if you didn't want to be an investment banker. And it was around the time that James Adroga died. And I remember, you know, this was not a connection that people outside of lower Manhattan were making at the time, but certainly it was something that everyone in Lower Manhattan, you know, light bulb went off where I, I just thought if this man could die of even, you know, there was all that controversy about whether his death was actually 9-11 related. And then we decided it was finally, but even if that could be a concern in a case like his, I just thought, now, wait a minute, I was down there that whole time too. Uh, like, that's also me. And so I saw the parallel right away. And I just thought me and my classmates are going to get sick. And, and no one has reached out to us and no one is talking about this. And certainly where the conversation is happening is not reaching us because we're all at college now. You know, it was four years later, every student who had been a student at Stuyvesant at the time was now in college. Stuyvesant sends 98% of their graduates to college. A lot of them were out of state. We were dispersed. And so I just thought, I'm not okay with this. And so um, in, in a move that was very much inspired by my mother's tendency to write letters to the editor and other, you know, and, and knock heads together on the hill if she had a complaint like this, I decided I was gonna write a petition. And so I wrote a letter and I sent it to a small group of friends just to get their feedback, you know, before I sent it to some of our representatives. And the letter just said, you know, you sent Stuyvesant students back downtown after 9-11 we were down there really early and we were minors. We weren't able to make a decision for ourselves about where to go. The law says you have to go to school and you told us that we had to go to school down there. So you should give us health insurance. You should, you should protect our health from now on because you know, you're, we're about to graduate and we're gonna enter into a system that has no protections for people like us. And I remember I had this friend from Stuyvesant who was like a nice Jewish boy from the Upper West Side, but had been kind of flirting with you know, making his parents crazy by telling them he was gonna be a Republican. And it was 
like, you know, for, for like nice Upper West Side parents, like a, it was like his rebellion move, you know, of the era. And so I sent it to him just wondering how he would react. And he, he was the first person to write back and he said, you can sign my name to this letter if you want. And so I just thought, oh, I have something here. And so I, I started using Facebook, which was new at the time and it was only at colleges. And so you could really effectively reach Stuyvesant alums, but you know, our parents weren't on it yet. Um, and just started reaching out to people one by one and asking if they would sign their name to the letter. And when I had about 150 signatures, which isn't a ton, but it was enough, um, I, I sent a draft of the letter out and then I kept gathering signatures. And then I was at, my mother sings with this group or sang with this group, I guess she still does, um, called the Raging Grannies, which is an anti-war group that's dresses up in like doilies and quilted, you know, clothing and goes to anti-war rallies and rewrites, you know, famous songs with anti-war lyrics. And so there was a big anti-war rally going on down near our house. And my mom was going to be singing with the Raging Grannies and they got invited to be in the lead contingent. And the lead contingent was, you know, for the before rally was the area where all of the like politicians were circulating and all, you know, like I'm sure Susan Sarandon or somebody was there, like, you know, all the early speakers were congregating in this area. And so she snuck me into the lead contingent and I went around and just shook hands with every politician I could find and said, I just sent your office a petition. I'm a student at Stuyvesant and I want to talk to you about 9-11. And it was then Manhattan Borough President Scott Stringer who said, great, we'll set up a meeting and set up a meeting for that Friday, like set up a meeting right away. And I went into his office and they were ready to hit the ground running on that issue. They put together, you know, they, they had us, <clears throat> they put us in touch with a bunch of, you know, with, with Carolyn Maloney's office and Jerry Nadler's office and, you know, some of the other downtown politicians. They set up a press event for us to, you know, advocate for funds for a clinic at the city. And that was kind of how the whole thing got rolling. It was really uh, by the good graces of Scott Stringer that I was able to find the rest of the advocacy community and start participating. Um, and then after that, you know, I sort of, I was, the student advocate on the scene. And so that, you know, we, we went to Washington in 2009, 2010. We went back in 2015. Obviously I was there in 2019 for the uh, second Zadroga renewal and testified there as well. Um, and so that was kind of how the whole thing got off the ground. And what do you do for a living? I'm a freelancer, I'm a writer. Um, and I, I've been working in entertainment mostly, which is why I live in California, but I've really, kept this work with Sty Health kind of alive this whole time because it was important to me. And so I kind of just do that on the side and there are years where it has to take precedence in my life. So last year, for example, I basically took a year off of work to go, you know, do to do that advocacy work, to be available, to be in Washington, um, because I thought it was really important that the younger victims of 9-11 have a face in that conversation. You know, we were asking for the VCF to be renewed for 70 years, and I thought it was really important that they understand why. Uh, so I, I sort of on and off, I periodically had to take hiatuses from working in order to pursue this work. Um, and then, you know, in there are years where it's less sort of at the forefront and I'm able to just kind of make sure that I can answer emails about how to apply to the programs and, you know, push information out about uh, about some of the resources for 9-11 survivors and things like that. So I've just kind of, I've, I've uh, just kind of attached myself to this and I kind of roll with it, whatever the needs are. And you have a book coming out. I have a book coming out. Yeah, I have a book that will be coming out around the 20th anniversary. It's preemptively being titled Some Kids Left Behind, but stay tuned. I, I think that will be the title. Um, it's from Apollo Publishers and it's it's going to be a, you know, my story of both 9-11, but also really focusing on the advocacy work that I did in the aftermath and hopefully also helping other people figure out how they can do this for the issues that affect their lives. You know, I was not a, I came out of a very political family. I had the advantage of having a mother who had always sort of taught me that, um, that, that Washington and you know the, the the Capitol Hill belongs to us the people and so that I didn't have to be afraid to approach politicians about issues that I needed them to address and that you know that I had access even if it didn't seem like I had access and so because of that I think you know I was able to take an approach that I think without good civics education I don't think everyone would have thought to do 
Um, but so I'm, I'm sort of hoping also that in the process of telling the story, I can kind of demystify what some of the challenges are to doing this kind of work and also what, you know, what, what some of the things that you should know going in are to make sure that you understand what your rights are and how to, how to really advocate for yourself. Is there anything else you want to add? I don't think so. I mean, I think, you know, it's important to me that 9-11 survivors who have a tendency to kind of to not see themselves reflected in coverage of this issue very often understand that they are like that they are valid survivors of this attack that they deserve access to the resources that the federal government has set up for them that they do not need to go through extensive hoops to validate that you know that that the barrier to entry is actually quite low in these programs and if you can provide any sort of proof that you were downtown either on 9 11 or in the aftermath of the attacks and if you can you know, if you have any concerns that you think might be 9-11 related, that that is enough to go seek care from these programs. You don't need to be, you know, wait until you're stricken with a horrible kind of cancer in order to start getting care from them. Um, and that also, especially for those of us that live outside of New York City, there's care available outside of New York City. I get my 9-11 health care out here in California. I, I see great doctors out here through the program. Um, and I think the it is even harder to get over those barriers, those mental barriers to entry when you live outside of New York because almost nobody reflects back to you that your experience was as traumatic as, as, as all of us know it was. And so, um, especially if you live outside of New York City, you should really um, be, be willing to claim these resources. Like, that they, they, you deserve them and they belong to you. Okay, thank you, Lila. And thanks for all that you do as well. Thank you, yeah, thank you for doing the series.